The Abrahamic Covenant, a study outline of the identity of God's people, by E. Raymond Capt. Almighty God said, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Genesis chapter 17, verses 4 through 7. Let it be noted that this covenant was an everlasting contract. Concerning this covenant, it is said in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20, that because God had sworn to it by an oath, and because it was impossible for God to lie, the covenant is immutable. The covenant was unalterable, unchangeable, and everlasting, which means it must exist today. Read the entire covenant in Genesis 17, and you will find it not only concerned the ownership of all the land from the river Euphrates to the river Nile, but, overshadowing all else, it was a covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee in their generations forever. Can we comprehend what that means? It has not been revoked. Now note that the covenant was made not only with Abraham for his lifetime, but also with his seed forever through Isaac. Genesis chapter 17 verses 8 through 24 and Romans chapter 9 verses 7 through 9 and through Isaac's son Jacob. So we find the everlasting covenant made by Almighty God with Abraham, Genesis chapter 17 verses 4 through 8, was established in Isaac, Genesis chapter 26 verses 1 through 5, and was ratified and confirmed to Jacob. Genesis chapter 35 verses 10 through 12. Special attention must be called to the fact that the covenant was absolutely unconditional, unalterable, and unchangeable. It did not depend on what the descendants of Abraham did or did not do. The covenant stands forever on the oath of God. Abraham was also promised a tremendous number of descendants. Three symbols are used in Genesis to describe the number. 1. The dust of the earth. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 28, verse 14. 2. The Stars of Heaven And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, If thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 3. The Sand of the Sea That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Genesis chapter 32, verse 12. God later changed the name of Jacob to Israel. Genesis chapter 35, verse 10. So his descendants, who were the inheritors of the covenant, were hereafter known as Israel. Jacob had twelve sons, each the head of his own family. Genesis chapter 35, verses 22 to 26. These families developed into the twelve-tribed nation of Israel. Jacob, hereafter called Israel, loved Joseph more than all his other children. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. After the eldest son Reuben sinned against his father, Genesis chapter 35, verse 22, Joseph, as the eldest son of Jacob and Rachel, inherited the birthright and special blessing. This made him the head of the family in regard to spiritual and secular affairs. Before Jacob Israel died, 
Joseph brought his two sons to his father to receive the blessing and the birthright. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. Israel crossed his hands and, laying his hands on their heads, blessed the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. He then said, And let my name be named on them. Thus his adoption of the two sons of Joseph created another tribe, making thirteen tribes in all. Although Joseph was displeased that his father's right hand was laid upon the head of Ephraim, the younger brother, Israel refused to uncross his hands. So Ephraim was set before Manasseh. Genesis chapter 48 verses 13 through 20. Thus Manasseh became the thirteenth tribe and received the promise of becoming a great nation. Ephraim was given the promise of becoming a company of nations. Genesis chapter 48 verse 19. Much of the history of the now thirteen tribes of Israel must, of necessity, be passed over here. The dramatic account of their sojourn in the land of Egypt for over four hundred years, their great deliverance by the hand of God from the land, and the still greater deliverance at the Red Sea when God caused the waters to stand back while he led his people across on dry land to safety, can be found in Exodus chapters 1-14. through 14. Finally, at Mount Sinai, God gave his people a code of laws, statutes, judgments, commandments, and ordinances. The latter ceased with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by which his kingdom on earth would be administered. Exodus chapters 19 through 40, and the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These laws covered every phase of both national and individual life, social, financial, economic, ecclesiastical, agricultural, dietetic, and personal. The keeping of these laws, based on the promise and the assurance of God, will result in perfect happiness and contentment with freedom from sickness. Concerning these laws, the psalmist wrote, The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. The people at Mount Sinai entered into a solemn covenant with their God and King, for they said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. That is what is known as the first or national covenant, and must not be confused with the Abrahamic covenant, which was made some four hundred years previously, and which was unconditional. The covenant made at Mount Sinai was made conditional upon the keeping of the laws, statutes, judgments, and commandments of God. So we find God laying before his people the conditions of this national covenant. If they kept his laws, blessed would they be in all their undertakings, blessed in the city and in the field, in the fruit of the ground, in their cattle and flocks, in assurance of certain victory over their enemies, and in health and prosperity among the people. But if they did not keep those laws, then the opposite would be the result. All their undertakings would be cursed. There would be crop failures, diseases in cattle and in their own bodies, poverty and sickness would overtake them, and their enemies would gain the victory in battle. All this may be read in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and in Leviticus chapter 26. Here, God warned Israel that if they persisted in continually breaking his laws, not only would curses come upon them, but he would punish them for seven times, a time being 360 years. Seven times would be 2,520 years. They would be banished from the land of Palestine and scattered among the heathen like lost sheep. Leviticus chapter 26 verses 28 through 46. After entering the promised land, the people obeyed the laws of the kingdom and received the promised rewards. All went well for many years. Then they began to tire and wanted to be like other people around them. First of all, they desired an earthly king, and God said that although in doing so they had rejected him, he would give them permission to have an earthly king. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verses 7 through 22. Saul was then appointed as Israel's first king. Later he was removed because of sin, and God himself appointed David, of the tribe of Judah, to be king over all Israel. God then established an everlasting covenant with David that his throne and his house would endure forever, as long as the sun and the moon endured in the heavens. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 11 through 17 and Psalm chapter 89 verses 3 to 4 and 29 through 37. 
and that there would always be one of David's seed of lineage to reign upon that throne over the house of Israel forever. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 17 to 26. So here we have, one, the everlasting covenant made with the Israel people through their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom God named Israel. Two, the kingdom of Israel established forever. Three, the throne and the house of David established as the monarchical system over the house of Israel forever. So the house of Israel, the throne of David, and the everlasting covenant must be in existence today. Note, the throne of David was also the throne of the Lord, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 23, and will yet be occupied by the risen Christ, the King of Israel. For the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33. Remember, he has not as yet occupied that throne. To return to David's reign, we find that he reigned for seven years over the house of Judah only, and then for thirty-three years over all Israel, named thirteen-tribed Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. During his reign, while Israel kept the laws of God, prosperity was the result. Of that time it is recorded, every man dwelt safely under his own vine and fig tree, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. A perfect social order existed wherein dwelt righteousness. So wonderful and glorious was the kingdom that kings and queens came from all parts of the earth to see the glories of the kingdom. But alas, Solomon, who succeeded his father David to the throne of Israel, began to sin against God, causing the people of the thirteen tribes to sin. As a result of their sin, God then divided the kingdom into two kingdoms. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 29 to 36. The ten tribes, under the leadership of Ephraim, formed the northern kingdom of Israel, with Samaria as their capital and Jeroboam as their king. The other two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with most of the tribe of Levi, formed what was known as the southern kingdom of Judah, with their capital located at Jerusalem, and Rehoboam as their king. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 16 through 20. Although Judah had received a large part of the tribe of Levi, she was still referred to as the two-tribed kingdom. The tribe of Levi, having received no inheritance with Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, was portioned among all the tribes for priestly duties. This did not remove Levi from being a distinct tribe, only from being numbered among the landed tribes. Although scripture thereafter refers to the twelve tribes or the ten-tribed and two-tribed kingdoms, Manasseh remained numbered as the thirteenth tribe. The titles House of Israel and House of Judah are used to designate the two kingdoms as they stand separated and in opposition to each other. The birthright tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, were included in the ten-tribed kingdom House of Israel, while the tribe of Judah, to whom pertains the throne or scepter through God's covenant with David, was part of the two-tribed kingdom, house of Judah. The scepter and the birthright were separated then and there. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 2 Each became a nucleus, all the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, gathered around either one or the other. The king of Judah assembled his army together to use force to unite the kingdoms, but God forbade it, saying he had divided the kingdoms. 1 Kings chapter 12 verses 21 to 24. Thus each was free and independent of the other to fulfill their God-appointed destiny, one to fulfill the first covenant which the Lord made with their father Abraham, that of having multitudinous seed, spreading abroad and becoming many nations having kings over them, the other to fulfill the second covenant of bringing forth the Messiah. After the division of Israel into two kingdoms, the people went deeper and deeper into sin. Finally, the warning which God had given them in Leviticus chapter 26, that if they persisted in sinning, he would invoke the seven times punishment and cause them to be removed from their land and scattered among the heathen, was put into effect. The Assyrians came against the northern kingdom, ten-tribed Israel, and defeating them in battles carried them away captive into Assyria. They were put into Hala and in Habor by the river Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. 
In one final invasion, the balance of the northern kingdom was removed into exile. The accounts of the invasions may be found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 6 through 18, and chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Some of the tribes had been removed in previous invasions by Assyria. 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. The cities of Samaria, once occupied by the people of the northern kingdom, were then repopulated by the Assyrians with captive people from Babylon, from Kutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sepharvim. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. These captives, not of Israel, were the Samaritans referred to by Jesus when he commanded his disciples to go not into the cities of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. Note that the term house of Israel after the captivity of both kingdoms often was applied to all the thirteen tribes collectively, including Judah. Sometimes the word whole house of Israel, house of Israel holy, and all Israel were used. In spite of the terrible experiences of the house of Israel, strange to say the house of Judah did not learn their lesson or heed the warning, for the scripture states that they continued in sin even more than the northern kingdom. Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 6 through 11. So we find the same punishment being meted out to them, starting with a series of invasions by Sennacherib, king of Assyria, 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 13, when a greater part of Judah was also carried away captive to Assyria. This was followed later by the invasions of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. On these later occasions, the captives of Judah were carried away to Babylon until finally they had all been removed from the land of Palestine. 2 Kings chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 and chapter 24 verses 11 through 14. The third invasion, 2 Kings chapter 25 verses 1 through 12, and then the final removal, 2 Kings chapter 25 verses 22 to 26, fulfilled God's warning to them in Leviticus chapter 26. This is where the modern churches fail to fully understand the scripture. They declared that because God had caused Israel to be driven from the land of Palestine, he had cast them away forever. In doing so, they teach, God had brought his kingdom, established at Mount Sinai, to an end, and in its place had chosen what they term the Gentile church, or spiritual Israel. In contradiction to this theory, God is faithful. He cannot and will not lie, and he will keep his everlasting covenant made with Abraham and his descendants Israel. For if he has cast his people away forever and they no longer exist, then God has lied and he has been unfaithful. He has broken his everlasting covenant with them and is not dependable. But we know he does not and cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 No evidence can be found in scripture that God has cast away his people forever. The proofs that God has not cast them off are too numerous to be listed here, but a few should be mentioned. Read Leviticus chapter 26, where God warned Israel that the result of continued sinning would be removal from their land to be scattered throughout the nations of the earth. But in the 44th verse, we have God's definite statement that even when they were in the hands of their enemies, he would not cast them away. Even for all their sin, he would not break his covenant with them. This is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 26 to 31. Again in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 to 9, after all Israel had been scattered, God says he has not cast them away. Then in the closing book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, God says to Israel, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. We also find in the New Testament when Christ, the God of Israel, came to earth, he declared, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 15 verse 24 Would he have come to seek a people that did not exist? Rather, it is declared of him that he came to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Romans chapter 15 verse 8 Also Paul, in answer to the question, Hath God cast away his people? replied in no uncertain terms, God hath not cast away his people. 
Romans chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. The epistle of James is addressed to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Peter wrote to the strangers and pilgrims in the lands through which they were scattered. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. A wealth of scripture can be found to prove that God has sworn he will never cast away his Israel people or break his everlasting covenant with them. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul, Peter, James, and the prophets all declare they were not cast away, but most churches of today teach that God has cast them away forever, thereby nullifying his everlasting covenant with them. Whom do you believe? If you really believe God, then there can be only one answer, and that is the answer given by Paul, God hath not cast away his people. What then became of them? Numerous passages of scripture could be presented to answer this question, but due to the brevity of this book, only a few will be given here. We will start with the prophet Jeremiah, and in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 10, he writes, And declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. That was a promise made by God to Israel after their dispersion. It is confirmed again in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 37 to 44. Then again in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 through 6, addressed to scattered Israel. In Jeremiah 18, God tells the prophet that just as the potter's clay was marred in the hands of the potter, but was taken again the second time and remolded into a perfect vessel, so would he do with the house of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 27, God told Israel he would save them from afar off, together with all their seed. And in Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 34, God promised to gather Israel out of the countries wherein they were scattered. In Amos chapter 9 verse 9, God declared that although he will sift Israel among the nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Then in the 14th and 15th verses, he once again promised to bring them to their own land in the appointed time, where they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them. Israel was to be divorced from the Mosaic law, and their identity temporarily lost to history, but known to God. They were to be re-covenanted in Christ to enjoy the Israel birthright in the appointed land. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10 Since the children of Israel were in Palestine at the time this prophecy was given, it follows that the appointed place had to be somewhere else. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 16, God sees his sheep, his people Israel, scattered upon all the face of the earth, as lost sheep without a shepherd. And the eleventh and twelfth verses state, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep, and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Here God is saying that he himself would come and seek them out as a shepherd seeking his lost sheep. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 10 And when Christ came to earth he said, I and my Father are one. John chapter 10 verse 30 Timothy understood this great mystery and stated, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 Clearly this was referring to Christ of whom the prophets foretold. He would be called the Son of God. St. Matthew also understood what was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Isaiah also gave among the names of the child the everlasting father. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Christ then openly declared, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 15 verse 24. 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John chapter 10 verse 11. The Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Matthew chapter 18 verse 11. He commissioned his disciples as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. A study of the epistles will soon prove that they have found Israel where they had been scattered throughout western Europe and part of Asia, and in the isles of the sea north and west of Palestine. A footnote here regarding the word Gentile. To better understand what Timothy said, it must be pointed out that the word Gentile, which is not to be found in any original scripture, is a translated word from the Greek word ethnos, which means heathen, people, or nations. The word could have been translated people, or even better, nations, for Christ did not go to the heathen, but rather he did preach to the people or nations of Israel, as will be shown later. Now, what is the purpose of the regathering of Israel? The answer from Scripture is that God may keep his everlasting covenant with them made through their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, he is going to restore his kingdom on earth with Israel once again as his subjects. Read what the prophets have to say on this subject of the regathering of Israel. Isaiah, from the 40th chapter to the end, is filled with the promises of God to Israel in the isles of the sea, and then to America, the place of his kingdom on earth, the new Jerusalem. At the second advent of Christ he shall take the throne. Luke chapter 1 verse 32. Jeremiah has much to say concerning the promise of the restoration of Israel and Judah. See Jeremiah chapters 30, 31, and 32. Ezekiel, from the 36th through the 39th chapters, gives the plans or blueprints for the restoration of the kingdom. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 16 through 17, the divided kingdom, referred to as the sticks of Judah and Ephraim, is joined into one stick. God clearly explains the meaning of this in verse 22, that the divided kingdom shall once again become one kingdom, or nation, with one king. And both the prophets Zechariah and Joel tell about the restored kingdom. In the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah, God pronounces woe upon the false pastors who have destroyed and scattered his sheep. But in the third verse is the promise that he will gather his flock out of all the countries whither he had driven them, and would bring them again to their folds. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 4 to 5. Who is this new king? None other than Jesus the Christ, the living God. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our Righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 6. Yes, Jesus Christ the King. Remember what was read in Luke chapter 1 verses 32 to 33? And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And also Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even for ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Yes, the risen Christ is going to return to take the throne of David and to reign over the house of Jacob forever with the whole thirteen tribes restored. This was made possible when Israel was redeemed without money after having sold themselves for naught. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 3. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah tells of the Redeemer and the terrible price he would have to pay to redeem his people from their sins even to the shedding of his precious blood there on Calvary, to make an atonement for his people. Yes, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 Yes, Jesus the Christ, the shepherd of his sheep, came to seek and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and give his life for his sheep. 
on Calvary's cross, he redeemed them and saved them from their sins. But he rose again on the third day, triumphant over death. Thereby he opened the way to eternal life to all who would believe on his name. He ascended into heaven, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 13. When he returns, he will take the throne of David and reign over the house of Jacob forever. This wonderful promise of the restoration of Israel and Judah will be preceded by a great cleansing, and God himself has undertaken to do that. God gives us the details of this in Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 16 through 38, and you will notice in verses 22 and 32 that God declares he is not doing it for Israel's sake, but for his own holy name's sake. In verse 37 he says these words, Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. Then Israel will be made ready to receive her king. Now, going back to the delivering or gathering of Israel to a new land as prophesied by Jeremiah, we read, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 3 also, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 8. This began with the fall of the Assyrian Empire when portions of the tribes started across Europe toward the isles in the sea. Many were yet in the area of their captivity, even until the days of Christ. At the time of the apostles, when upon the commandment of Christ to go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 to 6. They went into these areas seeking the lost sheep, the exiled tribes. This was the fulfillment of the scripture. Yet does he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him? 2 Samuel chapter 14 verse 14. In keeping with the scripture, the apostles went into the cities of the Medes, Galatia, Hala, Pamphylia, Cappadocia, and the region of the Eucene Sea. From these areas in Media and northern Mesopotamia, the Israelites were taken between 745 and 700 BC and became the so-called lost tribes of Israel. After a lapse of over 2,500 years, it might be thought that all hope of tracing the Israelites had been lost in the midst of antiquity. But archaeologists have, during the last hundred years, unearthed and published the original contemporary records of the Assyrians who took the Israelites captive, and it is from these records that vital clues have come to light. The clues, in the form of cuneiform tablets, identify the lost Israelites with the Assyrian name Gimira. They further recorded their migrations out of Asia Minor. The Assyrian records reveal one group of Gimira, Israelites, escaped to the shore of the Black Sea during the second year of Esarhaddon, 679 BC. After raiding Lydia and settling there for a while, the Israelites crossed the Black Sea to the Carpathian region, called in 2nd Esdras, ar Sareth, or Mountains of Sareth. The Greeks called these Gemira, Kimerioi, translated into English, Cimmerians. It is also mentioned in 2nd Esdras, chapter 13, verses 40 to 44, that some of the tribes of Israel made their escape into the mountains of Asia Minor by way of the upper Euphrates Gorge. The larger body of Israelites, who had not escaped the Assyrians, were later allowed to establish colonies in Saccassene and Bactria. These colonies were first called Gemira, but later Iskuza by the Assyrians. After the fall of the Assyrian capital Nineveh in 612 BC to the Medes and Babylonians, the Gemira colonies were driven out of Media. The colony of Saccassene passed through the Darial Pass in the Caucasus Mountains and occupied the steppe regions of South Russia. The colony of Bactria retreated across the Jaxartes River eastward into Central Asia, some going east as far as the borders of China. A rock-hewn inscription at Biastun in North Persia shows the Persian equivalent for Gemira was Saka, probably derived from Isaka or House of Isaac the name by which the Israelites called themselves, Amos chapter 7, verses 9 and 16. Ancient historians tell us that the people whom the Greeks called Scythians were called Sake or Saka by the Persians. 
The Greeks got the name Scythian from the Assyrian Iskuza, which is quite probably derived from Isaac. During the 5th century BC, the Scythian Israelites began moving across the rivers Don and Dnieper, thus coming into collusion with the Sumerian Israelites, who had earlier migrated round the west of the Black Sea. Knowledge of their kinship having been lost during the centuries of separation, battles ensued, forcing the Sumerians west. Some moved away to the northwest into the sparsely inhabited regions of the Baltic, where they later became known to the Romans as Cimbri. The larger body of Sumerians migrated as scattered bands up the Danube River, arriving near its source in South Germany about 600 to 500 BC. There they became known as Celts and Gauls. They gave the lower Danube the Celtic name Ister, meaning lowness. About 390 BC, some of the Sumerian Israelites invaded Italy and sacked Rome. About 280 BC, others invaded Greece, and as they migrated back into Asia Minor, they were called Galatians by the Greeks. However, most of them spread west and north across France and began to cross the English Channel into the British Isles. From the 5th to the 4th century BC, the Scythian Israelites established themselves in South Russia as the great and prosperous kingdom of Scythia. They formed close trade relations with the Greeks, whom they supplied with grain. Toward the end of the 3rd century, however, a non-Israelitish people, the Sarmatians, swept into South Russia from the east. By the end of the 2nd century BC, they had occupied all the Carpathian regions and the Danube. Only two small pockets of Scythians were left on the shores of the Black Sea, one in the Crimea and the other south of the Danube Delta. Squeezed between Sarmatians and Celts, the main body of Scythians were driven northwest, where they were later reported by the Romans as occupying the south coast of the Baltic and North Seas. As the Sarmatian tribes moved into Scythia in South Russia, there was a tendency to confuse them with the Scythians, but the Romans introduced the name German for the genuine Scythians, Germanus being Latin for genuine. Except in outlying parts, the name Scythian was dropped in favor of Germans and Sarmatians. Nevertheless, the land south of the Baltic and eastern North Sea was still called Scythia, and as late as A.D. 800, the old Welsh historian Nennius called the home of the Anglo-Saxons Scythia. It is well known that the Anglo-Saxons who came to Britain were called Germans by the Romans, and the Normans, who were the last to arrive in A.D. 1066, were of the same stock. As the Scythians were driven west by the Sarmatians, they in turn drove the Cimbri across the Rhine into France. The Cimbri, in search of living area, went roving and pillaging as far as Spain and Italy, but were almost entirely wiped out in battles with the Romans. One group did reach North Britain by ships and became known as the Picts. Between 400 and 100 BC, the Celts continued to pour into Britain to form the bedrock of the British race. One group in Spain, known as Ibers, the Gaelic name for Hebrews, moved into Ireland as Scots, naming the Ireland Hibernia, a name that still exists. Some Celts remaining in Spain became known as Basques, Others, in France, became known as Bretons. During the succeeding centuries, the Scythian Germans broke up into many divisions, possibly in some instances into their original Israel tribal families. One group settled around the shores of the Baltic Sea as Goths. Others became the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, and Vikings, to name just a few. Later, other Germanic tribes poured into the lands vacated by the Celts and established the Gothic nations of the Vandals, Lombards, Franks, Burgundians, and Ostrogoths. The tribes, as they migrated westward, mixed with a great number of Israelites who had left their homeland long before the captivities began. They had migrated due to overpopulation of their homeland, and later for fear of the then-rising Assyrian Empire. The people of Dan one of the tribes of Israel, were explorers and settled in new places. Centuries before the captivities, they founded colonies in Greece, which attracted immigrants from the other tribes. The Bible speaks of Zebulun and Naphtali as being great warriors. The blonde Hellenes, early Greeks, were noted for strong, healthy bodies. Many years later, when Greece brought home dark-skinned slaves and intermarried with them, the modern olive to dark-skinned, black-haired Greek was developed. Early Troy was founded by Israelites that came from Egypt before the Exodus. 
1453 B.C. From Troy came the Romans who settled in Italy. The Israelites, when reaching the Isles of the West, found that descendants of Judah's twin son Zerah, Zerahites who had never entered the land of Palestine, had preceded them. The authenticated arrival to the Isles of Brutus the Trojan in 1103 B.C. and his founding of the ancient city of London, first called New Troy, is also of the branch of Judah. They, too, had previously absorbed peoples known as the early Aryan Phoenicians, who had settled in the Isles over a thousand years prior, under the leadership of Hugadarn. Besides their stone monuments, among which are Stonehenge and Avabury, and their names, we have only traditional records of them. The similarity of stone groupings and astronomical alignments of the monuments found in Brittany with those of the peoples of early Asia is one link in the mass of evidence unearthed by biblical archaeologists in tracing these older Hebrew Phoenicians to the area where the Adamic or Aryan race originated, near the Pamir Plateau in Central Asia, an area that satisfies the geography of the first chapters of Genesis. These early Hebrew Phoenicians were referred to as Tarshish by ancient records, as well as Bible scriptures. Isaiah wrote, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 9. And again, I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud an old name for London, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the isles afar off. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 19. Ezekiel also wrote of the merchants of Tarshish. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 13. Going back to God's warning of the seven times punishment to be meted out to Israel if she persisted in sinful ways, it is logical to assume that the starting date of that punishment period would begin from the date of the removal of Israel from her homeland in Palestine. A study of the dates when the various tribes were taken into captivity will show that they were not all taken captive at one time. In fact, history records a difference of many years in their captivities. Thus, the punishment period of 2,520 years would start and end at different times depending on the tribe of Israel. Now, by adding 2,520 years to the starting date of each of the tribes of Israel going into captivity, where such dates are available, one can establish the ending date of the punishment period. Not all of the exact starting dates can be ascertained. However, in the cases where dates can be determined, we find that by adding 2,520 years to the starting date of a tribe's captivity, one comes to the date of the founding of an independent nation or kingdom. The first Israel tribe to be conquered by the Assyrians was Manasseh in 745 BC. Exactly 2,520 years later, America became a nation on July 4, 1776. In the case of Ephraim, we start with 721 BC when Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, fell to the Assyrians. Exactly 2,520 years from that date, Great Britain became a commonwealth, January 1, 1801. The last tribe to go into captivity was Benjamin. Remember Benjamin was lent as a light unto Judah, so that they would be light bearers before Judah for all times. As their captivity started later than any of the other tribes, we would expect it to end last, which proved to be the case. The great Scottish pyramidologist and Bible chronologist Dr. Adam Rutherford, FRGS, told the Icelandic nation many years ago that on a certain day and certain year they would become an independent nation. They laughed at him and said it would be impossible since they were under the control of Denmark. Exactly 2,520 years from the exile of Benjamin, Iceland became an independent nation. When invited by the Icelandic parliament to address them after their independence, Dr. Rutherford reminded them of his prediction, and many members of the parliament acknowledged they were of Benjamin. It is difficult to determine with certainty which Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Lombard, Germanic, or Celtic nation of today is basically from which particular Israel tribe. There has been much intermingling among the tribes in their westward migrations. In God's plan of the ages, they progressively became many nations in Europe, and a company of nations, the Commonwealth of Great Britain, with colonies and daughter nations. 
Today, certain European and Scandinavian nations appear to possess certain characteristics of the individual tribes of Israel, which may well indicate the people of those nations are predominantly of that particular tribe. For example, Denmark from Dan, Holland from Zebulon, Germany in part from Judah. Great Britain, although it can be identified with Ephraim, has a large infusion of Judah as well as other tribes. America, possessing the birthright marks of Joseph, can only be identified as modern Manasseh, the 13th tribe. Today, the United States is comprised of all the 13 tribes of Israel. This is in fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah. In those days, the house of Judah, tribes of the southern kingdom, shall walk with the house of Israel, tribes of the northern kingdom, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 18. Ezekiel also prophesies the joining of Judah and Israel into one nation. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick and they shall be one in mine hand. Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king, or head, shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 19 through 22. Little has been said heretofore of the portion of Israel remaining in Palestine, the remnant of the southern kingdom of Judah after the removal of the northern kingdom of Israel, along with a greater part of Judah, into Assyrian captivity. Josephus records that the portion of the nation of Judah carried into Babylonian captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar was a million and a half people. Seventy years later, when Judah was allowed to return to their homeland, although still in subjection to Persian rule, approximately 42,000 went back into Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple, and set up the nation, later to be called the Nation of the Jews. While in Babylon, many of the 42,000 intermarried with Babylonians, adopted the Babylonian financial, political, and ecclesiastical systems. Josephus further reports that many non-Israelites joined themselves to the returning Judahites. Later, Christ identified these people, also called Jews, as not of Galilee, John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, not of Abraham or of God, John chapter 8, verses 39 to 47, and not his sheep, John chapter 10, verses 26 to 30. These Jews themselves testified to not being a part of Israel by their response to Christ's words, The truth shall make you free, saying they were never in bondage to any man. John chapter 8 verse 33 All Bible students know every tribe of Israel was in bondage in Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 6 it was this mixed remnant of Judah, upon returning from the Babylon captivity in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, that became known as the Nation of the Jews, a name not applied to Judah prior to the Babylonian captivity. Included in this nation were the Edomites, known to the Greeks as Edomians, who had occupied Jerusalem during the captivity period. King Herod the Great was an example of this, as he was of Edomian, Edomite, origin, and thus not an Israelite. King Herod filled the ranks of the Sadducees with his own kind. This explains why the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and said there was neither angel nor spirit. Acts chapter 23 verse 8. By the time of Christ, continued mixing with Amorites, Philistines, Canaanites, Babylonians, and Hittites resulted in a racially mixed nation. From the Hittite infusion came the so-called Jewish nose, Hammond's World Atlas, 1954, page 266. Modern Jewry includes a further mixing with Mongol-Turkish people, for example the Khazar Kingdom of Russia, who adopted Judaism during the 8th and 9th centuries AD. Confronting the leadership living in Judea during the time of Christ composed primarily of Edomite Jews, i.e. Sadducees and Pharisees. Christ had these strong words to say, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. 
When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convicteth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. John chapter 8 verses 44 to 47 But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. John chapter 10 verses 26 to 30 John, recording God's word in Revelation, writes, And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, of Judah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 Also, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, of Judah, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 Christ clearly shows the separation of the people of Palestine into two classes in his answer to the question of why he spoke in parables. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Matthew chapter 13 verse 11 The parable of the tares, Matthew chapter 13 verses 24 to 30, again points up two classes of people, and Christ's explanation in Matthew chapter 13 verses 37 to 43 identifies one class, the good seed, as the children of God, and the other class, the tares, as the children of the wicked one. There are many so-called Jews today that are not descended from Abraham, but claim to be God's people. But claim to be God's people Israel, because some of them are of Judah. However, being of Judah does not necessarily mean they are still his people, for some of Judah were cut off from the promises to Israel. In Jeremiah, we find God showing the prophet how he separated the bad figs, the mixed seed, from the good figs of Judah, who were to be Christian people. For only of them could God say, I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 7 Of the bad figs, God says, and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse, in all places whither I shall drive them. Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 9 Keep in mind that although later historians, in writing about the people of Palestine, refer to them collectively as Jews, there were some of all the other tribes present. They had come to help rebuild the temple along with many Benjaminites who had been lent as a light unto Judah. Christ chose all but one of his twelve disciples from the tribe of Benjamin. Thus we find the word Jew being applied to more than one kind of people. This has caused confusion in our understanding of the scriptures dealing with the Jew. To add to this confusion, the translators of scripture often mistranslated the word Jew from such words as Iudeos, meaning from or being of, as a country, Judean, and Iudesmos, meaning Judaism, as accepting the Jewish faith and usages. Scripture refers to those that became Jews for fear of the Jews, in Esther chapter 8, verse 17, and even Paul said, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. As it is important to understand that in Scripture the terms Israel, Judah, and Jew are not synonymous, it is equally important to understand that the house of Israel is not synonymous with the house of Judah. The course of history is widely divergent for the peoples properly classified under each of these titles. When God speaks in prophecy to the house of Israel or the house of Judah, he does not refer to the modern Jewish nation of Israel. The prophets display meticulous care in addressing the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
To apply to one house a prophecy which refers to the other is clearly to misapply the message and confuse the issue. By failing to treat the house of Israel and the house of Judah as separate entities, the prophetic books of the Bible are set at variance with one another. Without this distinction, the words of one prophet nullify the pronouncements of a fellow prophet. It makes Isaiah call into question the prophecies of Jeremiah, also causing Jeremiah to impugn the declarations of Hosea. It sets Joel against Amos, Zephaniah against Zechariah, and makes Ezekiel contradict them all. Examples of such failure to make a distinction between the two houses are found in the paraphrasing of the Living Bible, which leaves the truth seeker devoid of understanding. It is clearly shown that the house of Israel is separate from the house of Judah in the prophecy regarding the future names of each. Of the Jews, mixed Judah, it was prophesied, And ye shall leave your name, Israel, for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee, and call his servants by another name. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 15 This has been fulfilled. The Jews have retained the name Israel for a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse. Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 9 While true Israel is no longer called by their old name. In fact, Israel is blind to their identity. Paul wrote, Blindness in part is happened to Israel. And Isaiah wrote God's word, Who is blind but my servant? Isaiah chapter 42 verse 19 And also, Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 2 God explains what that name is. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 His people are today called Christians. The nations of Israel are known as Christian nations. There are those that claim that America is not a Christian nation, as this would be discriminatory against other religions. However that may be, the records of the group of men that gathered in Philadelphia in 1776, Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, show they did establish this nation under God. The concluding words of our national anthem summarize the fact that the United States of America was born of a commitment to God and His principles. Also, America has been legally declared a Christian nation many times by the Supreme Court of the United States. Foremost was the Declaration, February 29, 1892, in a case involving a church and certain taxes. Holy Trinity Church v. United States, 143 U.S. 471. The highest court in the land, after mentioning various circumstances, added the following words. And these and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Let it be noted that this nation is not anti any religion, and it is not hetero-religious. It is Christian. It recognizes worship of God through Christ the Savior, the only mediator between God and man. As a Christian nation, it is generous and tolerates freedom of worship. But as a nation, it is not merely religious, it is Christian. It should also be noted that the framers of all the early constitutions of the states recognized this nation as a Christian nation. This was evidenced by such points as belief in Christ being a condition of holding public office, tax support and maintenance of public Christian schools, recognition of Sunday as the Lord's Day, and recognition of deity. This was expressed in terms such as grateful to Almighty God, so help me God, and in the name of God, Amen. Often reference was made to the God of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. The members of the Supreme Court of the United States take their oath of office with their hand on the Bible, the testimony of Jesus Christ, thus recognizing His authority as being greater than theirs. Washington, when offered a crown to establish this nation as a monarchy, said, America already has a king. God is our king. Who was the king of Israel? God was the king of Israel, and he was the king of no other nation but Israel. Going back to the establishment of the first colonies, we find that in 1606, King James I of England, who issued the first charter, began with these words, quote, 
we greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may be the providence of Almighty God, hereafter tend to the glory of His divine majesty, in propagating the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. End quote. Subsequent charters were issued in 1609 and 1611, containing the same religious reference. The Pilgrim Fathers, who risked their lives and limbs to cross the sea, did so for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. In 1620, the Pilgrims, in their tiny boat the Mayflower, crossed the broad Atlantic to accomplish the noble words expressed in their now famous compact, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. And in the same year, King James I, in answer to another petition, granted the New England Charter, in which was included the following clause, We, according to our princely inclination, favoring much their worthy disposition, in hope thereby to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. The Charter of Massachusetts Bay, granted by King William and Queen Mary, and preceding the one by King Charles I, stated in part, may win and incite the natives of the country to their knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith. The fundamental orders of Connecticut, under which a provisional government was instituted in 1638 to 1639, stated, and well knowing when a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such a people, there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God, to order and dispose of the affairs of all the people at all seasons as occasion shall require. Do therefore associate and conjoin ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth, and do for ourselves and our successors, and such as shall be adjoined to us at any time hereafter, enter into combination and confederation together to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus which we now profess, which, according to the truth of the said gospel, is now practiced amongst us. One could go on and on, showing by history, tradition, and statistics that the United States is, in fact, a Christian nation. Christianity came to this country with the first colonist, has ever been powerfully identified with its rapid development, both as a colonial and national government, and today exists as a mighty factor in the life of the Republic of the United States. In like manner, much could be shown by history and tradition that the United States of America is from the tribe of Manasseh and is peopled by a gathering of all the thirteen tribes of Israel. Our pilgrim fathers, who called themselves the seed of Abraham, God's servant, and the children of Jacob, his chosen, allotted their land as Israel did. They followed after the counsel of Moses, the lawgiver of Israel, and in all their undertakings asked for the guidance and blessings of the God of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. From Manasseh, the thirteenth tribe of Israel, has come our national number, thirteen. Our first colonies were thirteen in number. There are thirteen letters in our national emblem, the American Eagle. Job chapter 39, verses 27 to 30. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, Psalm 103, verse 5, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. On the front side of our great seal, the eagle holds in its right talon an olive branch with thirteen leaves. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 16, Psalm 128, verse 3, Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. In its left talon, Thirteen arrows pointing upward represent the military power of the nation, which is always in a state of readiness to maintain freedom in the world. For centuries, arrows were the weapons of the Israelites. Second Chronicles chapter 14 verse 8, First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 2, and First Chronicles chapter 5 verse 18. In its beak, the eagle holds a scroll on which is written in thirteen letters, E Pluribus Unum meaning one out of many. Above the eagle's head is a cloud in which shine thirteen stars, Luke chapter 2 verse 9, Numbers chapter 9 verse 17, 
Numbers chapter 10, verse 34, Psalm 105, verse 39, Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 20, Exodus chapter 16, verse 10, Exodus chapter 24, verse 16, Exodus chapter 34, verse 5, and Exodus chapter 40, verse 38. There are 13 bars on our flag and 13 rods in our national mace. On the reverse side of our great seal is shown a symbolic pyramid. Its suspended apex stone portrays the all-seeing eye of the Almighty, watching over the destiny of our nation. This pyramid, identified with the Great Pyramid of Giza, Isaiah chapter 19, verses 19 through 20, consists of 13 courses of stone. Above it is written in 13 letters, Anuit Coeptis, meaning, He has favored our beginnings. Altogether, there are 13 13s in our heraldry. The number 13 was also identified with the early colonies. Massachusetts had on its emblem a pine tree with a motto above which read, An Appeal to God, 13 letters. At the base of the tree was coiled a rattlesnake beneath which was another motto in 13 letters, Don't Tread on Me. Our first navy consisted of 13 ships, and in many important dates in our history, both in war and peace, the number 13 stands out preeminently. Our flag is made up from the colors of scarlet, blue, and white, the colors of Israel of old. These colors covered the table of shewbread within the tabernacle. Red is the color of blood and signifies justice or judgment, reminding us of the shed blood of Christ for the redemption of his people Israel. White signifies purity or holiness, the color of snow. Psalm 51 verse 7, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Blue, the color of the heavens, signifies love and is representative of God. The name Manasseh means forgetfulness, and if there has ever been a people forgetful of all their past, it is this last, this thirteenth, this Manasseh Israel people in the United States. However, America, as prophesied of Manasseh, did become the great nation, one out of many, and took her place in the appointed time in fulfillment of God's covenant with Abraham. America has yet to recognize her relationship to God and reinstitute his laws. Through the centuries, Israel has usually had to be chastised into repentance. Just as God used the Assyrians to chastise Israel, he is building up the enemies of Israel, America, to bring them into national repentance. Ezekiel, in chapter 38, writes of the day when the forces of Gog gather against Israel, saying, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 11 and 12. The people of our nation will be driven to their knees by coming events, and if they are to pray the prayer the prophet Joel lined out for them, word for word, they must first acknowledge that they are God's servant people. Joel's instructions are, Let them say, Bear thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Joel chapter 2 verse 17 as a people, we are no more worthy than any other people. It may be that because of our neglect of our heritage, we are less worthy than any people. Nevertheless, we are the descendants of Jacob Israel, of whom God said, Will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people? Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 1 In spite of our unrighteousness and national rejection of God, He will not alter His word. Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 The day will come when America, Israel, will give voice to the words spoken through the prophet Hosea. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 Our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will yet have the salute of our banners and the allegiance of all the people. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father, for ever and ever. 
It is hoped that the truths expressed in this booklet have renewed faith in God and in the inspiration of the Bible, and have created an interest in a more complete understanding of God's dealing with the man Abraham, whose remarkable destiny the world has yet to fully consider and understand.